here today. Got one of my old buddies here today, Eddie Jr. I remember the day he was born. I was young then. Yeah, I don't want to say how old he is, but I just, him and his lovely wife are here today. We, we love them. We love their family. His dad's a pastor, and we all grew up together. We won't tell you how we used to act when we were young, amen? Uh, we got saved, amen, and God called us to the ministry, amen. So we just thank God for that today. You know, we've been doing a series that I feel like God just wanted a few Sundays to ensure his people, to let his people know how big he really is. Sometimes life comes at us in such a way that it begins to hinder us. It begins to cause us to begin to look away from him. And I think God is reaching out to his church today and he's wanting us to realize how big he is. Sometimes we forget that. We forget how big he is. In this series that we've been doing, the first message was that he's a big God. The second message that we did was God is the, the God of bitter waters. How many know God takes bitter things and makes them better? Amen. That's what he does. And then the message last week was God has us covered. Amen. He's better than any insurance policy you can possibly buy. Amen. He's got you covered in every way. And I thank God for that today. Today, I want to share with you a message that God has laid on my heart. And I entitled it, God, the Molehill Maker. I believe that we are professional mountain builders. Come on. We can build something up so big, so quick, that it's amazing how we're professionals at taking small things and making them bigger than they really are. Amen? My grandmother used to tell me all the time that worry is interest paid on trouble before it even comes due. And as a kid, I used to think my grandma was crazy. But the more I began to study that and understand what she was saying, and her 99 years that she lived on this earth, I would draw from her things like this all the time. But when she spoke that, no truer words. How many want to pay interest before it even comes due? We don't want to do that, amen? But here's the thing about God. God is in a position where he wants to give us the things that make us happy. How many want to be happy in the Lord? How many want to have the joy of the Lord just flowing over in, in you to where you make it through any battle that you're getting into? And God truly can do that for you if we'll allow him to do that. We are specialists at making things bigger than they really are. I don't know about you, but I have what's called maybe a negative side to me. And I go negative a lot. And Doc knows this because we traveled together and we sang uh, together and, and, and played softball and did refereeing. And, and through the years, I had to battle that negative thing that would creep up inside of me. And I know for a fact that we can be so negative that God sometimes doesn't even have a chance. Come on. Let's be honest this morning. Sometimes we take and handcuff God with our negativity. We handcuff him because we take a situation that's in our lives that come, has come after us, and now we've made it so big that we're ready to give up and we don't even want to fight the battle. We are masters at sizing things up. You know, why do we have to size things up? Why do we always have to put a size on things? Why do we always see a problem and now we got to dissect that problem and we got to size it up and we got to figure out how big this thing really is? How many know that everything is small in God's eyes? Amen. Nothing is too big for him. You know, we go back, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Caleb, but we go back to the 12 spies when they went out into the land. They came back, and there was a situation there. Some of them sized up that situation and came back with negativity. They came back, and they said, there's giants in the land. They came back, and they said, we're never going to be able to get this thing done. They came back, and they said, we're, we're grasshoppers. We're like little grasshoppers grasshoppers in the sight of these giants. We can't get this thing done. But there was a couple of guys that stood up and especially one stood up and said, hey, we can do this. 
They didn't size it up naturally. Caleb sized it up spiritually. And he said, look, we can do this thing if we could ever learn how to trust a God who takes all of our mountains and turns them into molehills, man, we could truly live a better life. We could truly live a happier life. Satan loves this flaw in each one of us. Satan uses this against us as a weapon. He comes at us this way every time and tries to sit on our shoulder when a problem comes and a trial comes or when we're going through something. He sits on our shoulder and he wants us to see how big the problem is. He wants to continue to put rock upon rock to make it a mountain in front of us to where we'll back down and not even try to get through the situation. If we could ever realize what was done for us at Calvary, I believe this and we're teaching this as much as we can. If we could ever grasp the finished works of Jesus Christ, if we could ever grab a hold of the benefits that you and I have because of what Jesus did, the devil would be put on the run, amen, and we would live victorious lives and we'd never have to worry about a mountain in our lives if we would just know what Jesus did for us. I believe it with all my heart if we could just know that. We could realize we have power over the sin nature because it died with Jesus. How many know your sin nature died with Jesus? You have the power over sin nature. You have the power over the natural things in your life. You have that power through Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. I, I, I wrote this down. We are resurrected already into a new life. Some of you don't even realize that you already have a new life. You're a new creature in him. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are new now. I'm not what I used to be. I may not be what I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. I've made progress in my life because of what Jesus did on the cross. If we could grab a hold of this, we would look at every mountain and say to this mountain, what mountain? There's no mountain in front of me. Jesus took care of that very thing. Amen. Thank God we serve a God who loves to turn mountains into mohills. You know what? God is setting, wringing his hands on the throne saying, man, I can't wait to get rid of your problem. If you just allow me to get involved. Did I say that? If you allow me to get involved, if you allow my Holy Spirit to move in your direction and move in your situation, if you just allow that to happen, I will move in and I will make your mountain a molehill. I have a record here, a resume that is pretty impressive. This resume of God's is pretty impressive. This uh, uh, will and testament and stories and history and testimonies of how big our God is, is pretty impressive in here. As I go through the scriptures, I can see where Abraham was facing a mountain when he stood and he was standing in front of the mountain and he had Isaac and he knew he had to sacrifice Isaac because God had asked him to do it. Don't you realize the mountain that was in front of him? But he did not see the mountain. He saw the spiritual side of it. He knew that if he just obeyed God and did what he was supposed to do, God could bring the blessing down into his life and into the heritage of his people. Amen? As I look at Scripture and I see people like Israel at the Red Sea, how they were caught in a terrible place. Man, they were caught between the mountains and the sea and their enemy. But guess who showed up? God showed up and turned that mountain situation into a molehill, and they walked across on dry land. Amen? Amen? As I continue to read my scriptures, I look at David as he walked up to the Goliath. Can you imagine the mountain of a man? And here's this little uh, red-headed, did I say red-headed? The Bible says he was ruddy. And if you track that down, you're going to find out he was red-headed and probably had freckles too. And he was young. And the Bible says that the whole entire army was afraid of Goliath. They saw a mountain out there. They saw a mountain. 
There's no way we're going to get past this guy. He's too much for us. How many times has the devil stood in your valley of your life, shooting off his big mouth and telling you how big he is and how he's going to do this and he's going to do that, and you did just like the army of Israel and you stayed back and said, oh, I'm not going to win this one. You know what always amazed me, Doc? When I look at that passage and I read it and I really read it and I really study it, here's Saul, one of the greatest warriors of all time. One of the biggest guys that you can probably imagine next to a giant. Here's this king, Saul, who was a great warrior, and even he was sitting back saying, we can't do this. So here comes this little short, wiry, Ain't nothing worse than wiry. I don't know if you've been in fights before, but I'd rather fight a big guy than the little wiry guy, amen? Because they're like monkeys, man. They, you can't get rid of them, amen? And here's David, man. He shows up, and he looks, and he says, what in the world? David did not see the giant in the natural eye. David saw the giant in the spiritual eye, in the spiritual world. He saw that he was opposing a God who was too big, and we did not have to put up with it. Amen. So David stood there, and he went to Saul. We know the whole story. I'm not going to go into the whole story. You know the whole story. But the neatest thing about the scripture, if you read it, the Bible says he ran to Goliath. Woo, when you start to see things spiritually, you will be willing to run into your situation and say, I can't wait to see what God's going to do here. And we all know the story. David went down. The great victory was there. And, you know, we can go on into all the other resumes that we have and stories that we have in the Scripture. I've got Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den. We got the, he, uh, the three Hebrew men that were thrown into the fiery furnace. And then we got lepers throughout the Bible where they were facing mountains of problems and mountains of situations, but God come along, and the God that we serve is big enough to take care of any situation that you have. There are no mountains when God's involved. Amen. Give him a hand clap of praise. There are no mountains when he is involved. We have got to stop sizing up our problems. Go with me, if you will, if you want to, to... I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here. I want you to go to Zechariah 4. And I'm just going to read two verses, 6 and 7. I'm, this is the New King James. Some read out of others. Here's what it says. So he answered and said to me, this was when there was a vision given on rebuilding the temple. The angel of the Lord said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, who was the one who was engineering, the one who was setting up uh, the building of the temple. He said this, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 7, here's what happens when we look through the Spirit. This is what the angel was saying. It's not by your might. It's not by your power. It's by the Spirit that these things are going to happen. Verse 7 says, who are you, O great mountain? In other words, what in the world do you think you are, who you are, mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Mountain, you shall be brought down to a mohill because you're in the way of what God is trying to do. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. If you read that and understand that, you're going to find out there were three things that happened in that scripture. Number one, stop looking at the mountain through your natural eyes and see it through the spiritual eyes. Number two, if we see through the spiritual eyes, mountains will become mohills right before our eyes. Number three, God will bring us to a place of praising him and glorifying him because of his greatness. How many realize in your heart, you got to know this in your heart, that God wants to do great things because he wants the world to see how great he is. Because when we see how great God is, we want more of God. Amen? Amen. And that's his whole system. That's his foundation, that he does great things in you and I so that everyone can see what God can do and how big God is. 
And Zerubbabel needed this as he was going through and planning what he was doing. You know, I believe this with all my heart that we are in a world today where mountains arise everywhere we turn. If you drive by a gas station nowadays, it looks like a mountain, amen? If you look at our government today, it looks like a mountain. If you begin to see what's happening around the world today and you look over in Russia and you, you begin to see what's happening in the world today, everything seems to be building up and looking like a mountain. But that's if we look through our natural eyes. How many know that God started this thing? God's going to finish this thing. The church is going to win and we're going to be in, in, in a place to where we get us get the victories in life, no matter what's happening in the world today, God has a place for his people. He will take care of us. He will help us. He will encourage us when we're down and we're, we're thinking, man, God is going to be there to help us. Go with me, if you will, to Joshua chapter 14. This is my passage of scripture that I want to use today to share some things with you that will help us have the attitude that we need. I'm going to focus on a few things about Caleb's attitude. Attitude is a lot today, amen? I believe when the writer says that attitude creates altitude. I believe that with all my heart. If you have a good attitude, you can just about get through most things that you face. I was reading a statistic not too long ago about people who have been given uh, the word that they have a terminal illness. They didn't state which one it was. They just said people that have been given a terminal uh, 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 illness, uh, 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 they, they have a tendency to do one of two things. They either go straight negative or they have a positive look at the situation. They have proven statistically that those who have a positive attitude come through a whole lot faster and a whole lot better in those situations. I have played sports my entire life, and this is a sports thing too. I mean, when you go out on the uh, court, when you go out on the softball diamond, when you go out to do this or that, it's an attitude that makes a difference out there when you're in competition. You may not realize this, but there are good teams that got beat by worse teams because their attitude was wrong. Come on. We need the attitude of Caleb as we walk through this world that we're walking through today. And I want to share some of those things with you before we leave today. I'm going to start reading uh, uh, Joshua 14. I'm going to start reading verse 6. And I want to read this. And again, this is out of the New King James. And here's how it reads. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40, now this is Caleb, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. I want you to grab a hold of this. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Hold on to that. I brought back word as it was in my heart. Verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren who went it up uh, with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. Listen to this. So Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land where your foot uh, has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And he said, these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. I'm not there yet. Thank you, Lord. Verse 11, as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. I'm as strong, Caleb's saying, I'm as strong today, 45 years later, at the age of 85. I'm as strong today as I was then. Uh-oh. I don't know about you. 
I'm not near what I was when I was 40 years old. And I don't want us to miss this because sometimes preachers get on this and they preach, they preach specifically physical. I want you to understand, he wasn't just talking about his physical body. He was saying that I'm as strong in my faith in God. I'm as strong as in my belief in what God had said and promised me. I'm as strong in all those areas today as I was 45 years ago. I still believe it. I'm still strong in that faith. Verse 12, now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakin uh, were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Man, 85 years old, he's wanting to fight. 85 years old and he's wanting to take a fight. He's ready to go do what needs to be done. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, to this day because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was uh, 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 Kerjoth uh, Arba, uh, was the greatest uh, man among the, the Achanim, then the land had rest from war. Let me share some attitudes that we need to know about Caleb. Now, we could go into a whole lot of different directions in this message. Believe me, when we start talking about Caleb and we start talking about what God did in the promised land and the, and the, the splitting of the inheritance, we could go into so many different directions. But God asked me to focus on a couple of few things here that we need to grab a hold of. We need Caleb's attitude today to face the things that are coming against us and the things that we are facing in this world today. The first thing I want you to grab a hold of is we need to continue to be obedient to God's word. Amen. There is something today that is really confusing. We have people living and saying one thing, but they're disobedient and not doing what the word of God says to do. And they wonder why they're struggling in their lives. And they wonder why mountain after mountain is coming into their lives. And they don't realize that they're not being obedient. Now, I'm going to say this, and I want you to grab a hold of this. And I believe this in my spirit, that we can't be obedient. We can't be fully obedient until we have a right kind of faith. I believe our faith in God creates the obedience in us. And we're going to talk about that here in a second, but I want you to grab a hold of this. Caleb's faith, man, he was there. He said, 45 years ago, I was this way. 45 years ago, I believe what God said. 45 years ago, even though we were wandering around in the wilderness and we didn't know what was going to happen, I saw what God can do. I heard what God can do. I knew what God can do. And I know that God said it. I believe it. And I'm going to be obedient to his word. For 45 years, the Bible said in his heart, he wholly served God. I think we have a heart condition in the world today. I do. I believe we have a heart condition in the church world today. I believe the reason why our faith and obedience isn't where it needs to be up here is because we have not got it in here. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to us, man, you need to get this in your heart. I don't know about you, but when you get somebody that's finally got it in their heart, man, there's something about that. But we need to understand the importance of being obedient to God's word. Let me tell you something. If you're doing something in your life and the Holy Spirit is convicting you of it and the scriptures are right here telling you that it's wrong, you and I need to be obedient to the word of God. We need to do what the word of God is telling us to do. Amen. You say, well, if I do that, this is going to happen. Woo, boy, we're good at that. Lord, you know what we do first? We rebuke the devil. Oh, that's the devil right there. I rebuke that. Because that's just going to create a big old problem. 
And the Holy Spirit's saying, no, that ain't the devil. That's God. He wants you to do this. He wants you to do what's right no matter what it looks like. He wants you to do what's right no matter what it's going to cost you. He wants you to do what's right even though somebody close to you may be watching you and you're afraid, well, if I do this, I'm going to lose my relationship here or uh, this person's going to do this or my family's going to have, this is going to happen. How many know sometimes we got to stop doing that and do what God says to do? Let God deal with the circumstances. Let God deal with the aftermath. Let God do what he needs to do after we do what God has asked us to do. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, Pastor, how do you know what God wants you to do? And I said, well, there's a whole lot of stuff in here that God wants us to do. And see, that's a problem today, and I believe this with all my heart. One of the problems today is that we, we don't know God enough. We don't know what he wants because we don't study. We don't read. We don't get where we need to go, so we know what God wants from us. But I will say this, Caleb knew, and Caleb was obedient. Caleb, if, if, if God said it, Caleb said, I'm going to do it. When Caleb came back and the 12 spies with the 12 spies and he come back and he looked over there. How many know, you got to go there. Go to the story now. Make sure you understand this. When they come back, these guys, these other guys had already got all the people in an uproar. Man, there, there was a, a, a mass of people that were upset and saying, well, we can't do this. Why have you brought us out here? There's all these uh, people standing around. Anybody had that situation in your life to where you're the only one that's going to say, well, What's right? Man, if I speak up now, whoo, I'm going to get thrown into the lion's den. But guess what? Caleb said, I don't care. I don't care if they get mad. I don't care if they ostracize me. I don't care if they call me one of the crazy ones. I don't care about that. God said, this is what we can do. And he came back and he said, we are well able. We are well able. So it takes an obedience, man, to just do what God wants us to do. The second thing I want to give you today is continue being faithful to God. Man, it's so important. We have a lack of being faithful today. As you look at our churches all around, you see, and we hear it all the time, I have a few friends that, uh, that maybe not friends, but they're acquaintances for sure, uh, pastors that pastor large churches, and, and man, I, I've talked to them, and I've talked to some of their council people, and they tell me all the time, we are really getting killed. The mass exodus from the church is really hurting the megachurch. It's really hurting them because how many know uh, if you lose 1% of your people in a large, large organization, it's really going to hurt them. And as I look at how faithfulness is going today in our world today, and it comes back to this one thing, Caleb knew God and Caleb knew what God wanted so he could be faithful in every way. Sometimes being faithful is just coming to church. Uh-oh. I don't have a trap door. Sometimes being faithful is just coming to church. Somebody said the other day, I don't need church, man. I get, on, I get my coffee, I get my donut, I get up in the morning and I turn on my computer and me and my wife sit down, man, and we sit there and we watch different programs and everything. And I said, well, when you get sick, who you going to call? When you're in the hospital and you need somebody, who you going to call? When you're struggling and you, you have a real difficult situation going on in your life, who are you going to contact? Who are you going to get with? Who are you going to get to help you? And man, I begin to say, God, sometimes just being faithful to you is being faithful to your people. Sometimes it's just being faithful to read the word of God. Sometimes it's just being faithful to one another and being there when we need each other. Amen. Sometimes being faithful is something that we just need to do because now if we're faithful, God can move in a special way. 
Let me tell you something. I have people tell me this all the time, that I don't believe you can get favor in God. Well, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but there are people who can get favor in God if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and we become one of his favored children. I, and some of you, I, I know you've got one or two kids, or if you do have kids, and you know this for a fact. I don't care who you are. You need to be honest. There are times you want to kill one of them kids and another time you want to love one of them to death. Come on. Amen. One of them's acting up. Boy, they're acting up, acting up, acting up. You ain't getting no favors from me. Ain't happening. Don't come to me and ask me for a dollar. What? After what you just did, and you come to me and want a dollar? And you know it was one of them things where they did something right in front of you. Right in front of you. You saw it and they looked at you and they said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Aren't you glad that God is long-suffering and he loves us? But let me tell you something. I've had kids and, and we got kids. And I've had kids do that kind of stuff, and they lose my favor. They lose my favor. And then there may be one right next to them in the same age group, right next to them that's doing all the good things. And, man, I'm going, I'm going to buy them a candy bar. Amen? I want to reward them for being good and, and doing the right things. And some people don't understand this. Our Heavenly Father's the same way. Yes, He's going to take care of us. Yes, He's going to watch over us. Yes, He's going to forgive us. Yes, He's going to bear with us. Yes, He's going to love us. But when we're doing what Caleb was doing, wholeheartedly serving God, being faithful in every way, being obedient in every way, we find favor in the Lord. Ooh, I'm the apple of His eye. I believe, God, that I can come to you. Hezekiah went to the Lord and said, God, you just told me I was going to die tonight. But I've been a good kid. I have done all these things. I have turned this kingdom around. I have turned the people back towards you. I have done everything that I could do. And God said this. Isaiah, go back and tell him. I'm going to add 15 years to his life. He found favor in the Lord. Now, don't get this mixed up with works. I hate it when people get things mixed up with works. You cannot work yourself into heaven. You cannot work yourself into a great position in God. You cannot do that. We get to heaven through faith in the cross. Amen. We get, we get to heaven that way, through the cross. That's the only way, through our faith and the grace of God. But you can get favor in God when you be obedient and when you start being faithful to him in every way. The third thing I want to give you, grab a hold of this. Please grab a hold of this. We need to continue having a made-up mind. We live in a world today that is like this. Man, one day the media is saying this and everybody's jumping on board with the media. One day this is happening. Man, you meet somebody one day and then three days later you talk to them and they're totally the opposite. It seems like the foundation of the world today is shaking everywhere we go. And as I think about this, having a made up mind, man, I looked this up and, and, and I, want you to, I want you to hear this. I looked this up, made up mind. What's it mean to have a made up mind? It says here to make a final decision after you have, have had full consideration of a situation or a matter. To make up your mind means you have made a final decision. I want you to grab a hold of Caleb's, Caleb's made up mind. Caleb made up his mind 45 years before we're reading this scripture right here. He made up his mind then, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to do everything that I need to do because God is who he is. I'm going to have a made up mind to serve God and him only. Today, some of us just need to make up the decision. Man, we just need to make a decision. Man, I need to serve God. And I, and I believe this with all my heart because it's so true with humans. And, and I read that scripture and I wanted you to grab a hold of that because I want to bring this back up when Caleb said that I came back and I gave what was in my heart. 
See, it's so important to understand if we don't get it in our heart, our mind and our mouth's not going to be right. It has to get inside our heart. We have to have it in here to where no one can take it away from us. No one can discourage us. No devil can come against us and say, this is it. You're not going to make it because in my heart I know that I serve a God who is so big. He can take care of every mountain that's in front of me. I will be victorious. I am the head, not the tail. I'm on top and not the bottom because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. I have a made-up mind. No man can convince me that God does not heal today. I've had guys come along and say, you know what? People get healed because of their mental capacity. That God doesn't do that anymore. He doesn't get involved in healings and stuff. He doesn't do those things. And man, I look at them and I say, you are way too late to tell me God does not heal people. Because he is Jesus Christ. He's Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. He does not change. He is God. He is the molehill maker. He will take care of every mountain you ever faced in your life. He is God. He's a big God. And we need to give him praise. Because he is worthy of our praise. My mind is made up. And I'll tell you what. I've shared this with you before. My mother used to say, you are the most, the most bullheaded, stubborn kid that I've even known in my life. And guess what? She was right. But you know what? That comes in handy when you get it down in here about God and how good God is, you get it right here, and guess what? Nothing can change your mind. He's God. Oh, yeah, we can fall. We can falter. We can have some problems. We can get shifted off the road, and, and we can get a little bit of sifting in our lives, and sometimes it, it, it shifts us out of the way, and we struggle, and we're off the path a little bit. But let me tell you, down here inside my heart, I know, man, that God is who he is, and he's going to bring me right back where I need to be. Amen. That's the God we serve. The last thing I want to leave with you, and I want you to hold on to we have the molehill maker living inside of us. This is something that I wish and pray for every saint of God, that we could truly grasp what's living inside of us. The power that we have in here, the Holy Spirit power that's sitting right inside of each one of us and is waiting and begging, let me free. Give me some room. Welcome me into your life. Let me be who I need to be in your life so that you can become everything that God designed you to be. Every one of us inside of us have this power uh, uh, over everything that we face in our lives. When Jesus died and went into heaven, he said, I, I, I must go. It's urgent that I get out of here because now I can give you the Holy Spirit. So I don't think we grasp sometimes the power that's behind that. Jesus was saying, I need to get out of here. I need to get to heaven so we can release the Holy Spirit onto this earth and you can receive the Holy Spirit. And now through the Holy Spirit, you have all of my power. You have all of my authority. You can stand up against any mountain and you can ask the Holy Spirit to help you and you will get through. Man, when you read about the saints of old and you read about some of, uh, some of our wonderful, wonderful men of God and women of God who have been through so many different things and the power of the Holy Spirit that was unleashed in their life and the great miracles that followed them, man, what a powerful thing. But today we have a problem in the church world. We don't want to talk too much about the Holy Spirit. And I never have understood this because it, it makes no sense to me that the Holy Spirit is God, but we don't want to talk about him. We don't want to bring it up. Because guess what, Pastor? Somebody might start speaking in tongues. Ooh. 
You might have somebody run the aisle. Who knows? Somebody might grab a hold of that fan while it's on. I've seen it all. Now, when David said I could run through a wall, I think he was talking about a little bit different, but I've seen folks try to run through a wall too, right through the drywall. Amen? Hey, go over and help them pull them out. Get them out of the wall. And all the while, you're pulling on them, getting them out of the wall. The saints are shouting everywhere and everything's just, and, and, and you know, I don't understand a lot of it, but I know this much for sure, that the Holy Spirit is ours. He is the power of God. He is the one who will get you through anything you will face in your life. He's the one that walks beside you, behind you, in front of you. He's the one making the way straight. He is the power of the living God, and he is inside of each one of us ready to do his work. All he wants is us to get out of the way. Will you please get out of his way? Amen. We come in here on Sunday mornings, and, and y'all don't know this, but every Sunday morning, one of my prayers is exactly the same. Before I leave my house, I get on my knees and I pray and I say, God, today I don't want them to hear me. Today, I don't want them to hear the singers. Today, I don't want to hear anything else. I want them to hear you, the Holy Spirit. Speak to them in a way that they need to be spoken to. I can only talk to your mind, but guess what? The Holy Spirit can speak to your heart right here. And when you leave this place today, you'll have exactly what you need. Because the Holy Spirit will give you that. Whew. God is good. Man, did he not supply everything that we need? And I had somebody the other day that said, Pastor, I believe you. I've been doing everything I can to get through this mountain. I've been praying that this mountain gets moved. And sometimes, folks, you just got to understand something. Sometimes mountains are meant to be climbed. Sometimes mountains are meant to be climbed. Because guess what? In the climbing, we find out who we are and we find out who God is. Amen? I've said this before and I'll say it till to, to the day I die. If you truly believe in your life that God is in control of everything, then everything that comes into your life, whether it's bad or good, God has either put it there and designed it to be there or he has allowed it to happen. And if my good God has either put it there or he has allowed it to happen, guess what? There is something good for you and I behind it, and we need to grab a hold of it and say, God, this is meaning for my good. I know this is bad. This looks so awful, but God, I know that you have something good in this for me. And guess what? When he grows us, we're able to grow other people. Not about you and I. Sometimes we, we think the victory is all ours. But we don't understand that the victory is not just for you. The victory is for those around you. The victory is for you to take to someone else. And it just moves the way God wants it to move. So having a made up mind is so important. It's something that we truly need to grab a hold of. It's something that will, will help us. And, and, and we have the Holy Spirit standing ready with dynamite and, and bulldozers ready to just take care of every problem that we have. But will we invite him? Here's the question. Are you going to get tired of doing it yourself? Oh, Pastor, you could have went the whole message without saying that. Are you going to finally give up? Are you going to finally say, God, I have tried this and tried this, and I can't master it. I can't get rid of it. It won't go away. Are you finally going to get to the place to where you say, I can't do it, but I know who can? You can do it, God. Let me step out of the way. Do your work, Lord. Men sometimes look at that as giving up. 
We look at it sometimes as I, I can't be a man if I stand back and let that happen. But let me tell you something. We need to let God run everything in our lives. Amen. Everything. Our families, you want to protect your family? I, I used to believe this. Man, I got to protect my family. I got to take care of my kids. I got to take care of my grandkids. And I used to run myself crazy and, and trying to figure out how I'm going to help them here, help them here, help them here. And finally, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, those aren't your kids. They're mine. I just loaned them to you to take care of. And I equipped you to take care of them. But guess who ultimately protects them, keeps them, provides for them, helps them, encourages them? It's God. Amen? The Holy Spirit. So I've learned to step back off of things and say, God, I, I want to jump in here. I, I want to I choke this one. But God... They're yours. Hands off, God, you got it. How many know 99.9? Now, I'm going to say 100% of the time, God comes through. He does. Never fails. God never fails. And today, I want you to grab a hold of this because he truly is a molehill maker. And he takes every mountain that we've ever faced I could go around this room right now and ask for your testimony. What is the biggest mountain that you faced in your life? And I guarantee you, before your story's over, you're going to give the answer that I did not think I was going to make it through, but God come along and he took care of my situation. Come on. Some of you have been through cancer. Some of you have been through this. Some of you have been through that. Some of you have been through situations that are just uh, unbelievable situations, but yet God was there and God took care of the situation. Well, that's who he is. That's what he does. We can trust in him to do those things. Will you trust him today? That's the question. Will you allow him to take over? Will you allow him to do what he wants to do? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, I just know that you want to set us free. You want to deliver us. The situations, God, that every life in here is facing Life comes at us. Satan is busy. Lord, we're facing situations in our lives that sometimes seem like mighty mountains. But God, you, you are the God who brings those mountains down to plains, to level ground. God, I thank you for that. By the uplifted hand, how many folks in here today say, Pastor, I've got to start trusting God with my mountains. Come on, get them up there, amen, all over the place. Let's do this before we leave. We're going to open up the altar. I want to pray together. Come on up to the altar if you can, if you want to. I want to pray together as a church family before we leave today. You know, sometimes we have a misconception of what obedience is in the world we live in today. And I looked it up this morning. It says, being willing to comply with a command from a person in authority. Being submissive to someone else in authority. And I thank God for that. We can be obedient to God because he is in authority. Amen. Amen. Being faithful means remaining loyal and steadfast. Remaining loyal and steadfast. Staying true. Hanging in there. Not giving up. That's being faithful. And I believe he's calling us to do those very things today. 
Reach out, touch somebody. We're going to pray for each other. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that we as Christians can grasp the heart of Caleb. Grasp his heart. Grasp his attitude. Lord, I pray that we can be obedient and we can remain faithful. And God, that we have a made-up mind that says, I'm not turning back. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And God, that we realize the power and the authority that we have in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, release these that are here today with things that they can't seem to get rid of. I pray that you move in a special way. Do the office work. Move on the hearts and minds of all that are here today. Father, we love you. We praise you. God, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your presence has been here and is here today. And God, that when we leave this place, we'll not leave here the same way. Lord, encourage that one that needs to be encouraged. Lift up that one, God, that is struggling. You are the lifter of our heads. Put joy where there is no joy. Put hope in that hopelessness. God, let us see you in the land of the living, walking amongst us, doing your great wonders. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives. Holy Spirit, have your way. Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. Your word is so powerful. Lord, it, it does everything that it sets out to do. We love you. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. All in the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Let's give God another hand clap of praise. <laughs> praise the Lord. Brother Brian, will you dismiss us in prayer? Would you do that? Sure. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your fellowship this day. We thank the word that you were brought to us. Heavenly Father, just bless everyone.